Shinya Yamanaka was a, a scientist who won the Nobel in 2012 for some work he did in about 2007, where he discovered that you could just take four transcription factors and actually just by turning on these four genes, turn an adult cell all the way back into a young embryonic stem cell. This is a pretty emerging, amazing existence proof that shows that you can reprogram a cell's type and a cell's age simultaneously just by turning on four genes. Out of the 20,000 genes in the genome, the tens of millions of biomolecular interactions, just four genes is enough. That's a shocking fact. From my understanding, the way he identified these four transcription factors was that he found the 24 transcription factors that associated uh, that have high expression in embryonic cells, and then he just turned them all on in a somatic cell. And um, sorry if I'm butchering the details, but basically he systematically removed from this set until he found like the minimal set that still induces a cell to become a stem cell. Why can't we do the same things for the transcription factors that are associated with younger cells or express more in younger cells as opposed to older cells and then keep eliminating from them until we find the ones that are necessary to just make a cell young? I wish it were so easy. <laughs> um, you're entirely right. You know, Shinya Yamanaka was able to do this with a relatively small team with relatively few resources and achieve this remarkable feat. Yeah. So it's entirely worth asking. Why can't a similar procedure work for arbitrary problems in reprogramming cell state? Yeah. Whether it be trying to make an aged cell act like a young one, diseased cell act like a healthy one, why can't you just take 24 transcription factors and randomly sort through them? So there were two features of Shinya's problem that I think make it amenable to that sort of interrogation that aren't present for many other types of problems. And this is why he's such a remarkable scientist. Most of science is problem selection. You don't actually get better at pipetting or running experiments after a certain age, but you do get better at picking what to do, and, and he's amazing at this. So the first feature is that measuring your success criterion is trivial in the particular case he was investigating. He's starting with somatic cells that in this case were a type of fibroblast, which literally is defined as cells that stick to glass and grow in a dish when you grind up a tissue. So it's like, sounds fancy, but it's a very, very simplistic thing. So he's starting with fibroblasts. You can look at them under a microscope and you can see their fibroblasts just based on how they look. And then the cells he's reprogramming toward are embryonic stem cells. So these are tiny cells. They're mostly nucleus. They grow really, really fast. They look different. They detach from a dish. They grow up into a 3D structure. And they express some genes that will just never be turned on in a fibroblast by definition. So actually how he ran the experiment was he just set up a simple reporter system. So he took a gene that should never be on in a fibroblast, should only be on in the embryo. And he put a little reporter behind it so that these cells would actually turn blue when you dumped a chemical on them. And then he ran this experiment in many, many dishes with you know, millions upon millions of cells. The second really key feature of the problem is this notion that those cells he's converting into amplify. They divide and grow really quickly. So in order for you to find a successful combination, you don't actually need it to be efficient almost at all. The original efficiency Yamanaka published, the number of cells in the dish that convert from somatic to an induced pluripotent state back into a stem cell is something like a basis point or a tenth of a basis point. So like 0 0.01, 0 0.001%. If the cells were not growing and they were not proliferating like mad, you probably would never be able to detect that you had actually found anything successful. It's only because success is easy to measure once you have it, and even being successful in very rare cases, one in a million, amplifies, and you can detect it, that this, I think, was amenable to, to his particular approach. So in practice, what he would do is dump these factors or this group of 24 minus some number, eventually whittling it down to four. He would dump these onto a group of cells. And over the course of about 30 days, just a few cells in that dish, like a countable number on your fingers, would actually reprogram. But they would proliferate like mad. They form these big, what we call colonies, because it's like a single cell that just proliferates and forms a bunch of copies of itself. They form these colonies. You can see with your eyeballs by holding the dish up to the light and looking for opaque like opaque little dots on the bottom. You don't need any fancy instruments. And then he could stain them with this particular stain and they would turn blue based on the genetic reporter he had. So now we look at those key features of the problem and we pick any other problem we're interested in. I'm interested in aging, so that's the one I'm going to pick for explanation. How difficult is it to measure the probability, the likelihood of success or whether you've achieved success for cell age? Well, it turns out age is much more complicated in terms of discriminating function than actually just comparing two types of cells. An old liver cell and a young liver cell prima fascia actually look pretty darn similar. It's actually quite nuanced, the ways in which they're distinct. And so there isn't a simple trivial system where you just like label your one favorite gene or you can just- Just give the young cells cancer. Uh, they'll, they'll grow, you know? Yeah, yeah, just, just, make them, them. <laughs> just, just make the old ones cancer and then they'll grow. Yeah, Dorkesh, you've solved it for me. Um, so the, there's no trivial way that you can tell whether or not you've succeeded. You actually need a pretty complex molecular measurement. If you enjoyed this clip, you can watch the full episode here and subscribe for more clips. Thanks.